But that brings up another question. You might ask yourself, how do I know if God chose me to be in the heavens? Or if God has chosen me to be a part of that new earth? Well, the Bible can help us to answer that question as well. Turn with me this time to Romans, the 8th chapter. And I take a look there at verses 16 and 17. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are God's children. If then we are God, we are children, we are also heirs, heirs indeed of God, but joint heirs with Christ, provided we suffer together, that we may be glorified. So here it mentions that it's God's Spirit that bears witness with the individual. It's an unquestionable witness borne by God's Spirit to that individual, and they are 100% confident of that choosing by God. It's unmistakable and absolutely clear. Anyone who has not had that experience with God's Holy Spirit can be 100% sure that their hope and that they have been chosen by God to be a part of the new earth and have a hope of living forever here on the earth. There's something I'd like to point out with what was just raised with Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Now, if we go to the beginning of the chapter, it's talking about the contrast between those who live by the Spirit and those who live by the flesh. You're either one or the other. Now, as a Jehovah's Witness, which one are you? Are you one who's living by the flesh? Well, of course not. You're going to say that you have the Holy Spirit. So when you read Romans chapter 8, in the beginning when it's making that contrast that has to be speaking of you according to your view that you live according to the Spirit. That's just what you have to do if you're a Christian. You can't look at that any other way. Now what's interesting is when we get to verse 14 which says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now, if I understand Watchtower theology correctly, only those who are of the anointed class are sons of God. What's interesting here is that all who are being led by the Spirit are sons of God. Are you being led by the Spirit? If you are, then according to this verse, you are a son of God. And so it doesn't just stop there. That continues on to verse 15 and 16, which says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified in him. If the uh, sons of God, in verse 14, who are being led by the Spirit, are the same group which is being talked about in verses 16 and 17, then that's speaking of all true Christians. All who are led by the Spirit are sons of God, and all of those inevitably have to have that testimony of the Spirit. And if they don't, then you are not a son of God. And you're not led by the Spirit. So that's the dilemma I see here. And I see no reason for making this some type of internal testimony that tells you what your hope is supposed to be. I mean, what does that even look like? Those ones are ones who, rather than being partakers in tonight's, celebration, are respectful observers of this memorial occasion. This is truly uh, one of the saddest part uh, of this whole memorial service, to be respectful 
observers. Now, if you're a follower of Christ who believes that Jesus actually atoned for your sins personally, then that comes across as quite offensive because we can't simply just observe this event. We have to partake. And the reason we partake is because we are doing what Jesus said to do. He said to do this in remembrance of me. And that this does not include mere observation. That includes partaking. And there's a reason for that. And there's a reason why Jesus said this to his disciples. So that they would remember what he was about to do. And all future Christians throughout all generations would remember what Jesus did. And you cannot remember that by simply observing. But furthermore, where is observing found in the scripture? It would just seem to me that if there's two categories of Christians, then Jesus would strictly differentiate between the two. One should partake and one should observe. But I don't even know what this observation means because the only thing we can actually remember is Jesus' death. And the only way we can remember that is to partake. So refusing to partake and simply observing seems to be disobeying Jesus' commands. For some, though, the idea of living forever on earth rather than in heaven is unfamiliar. Why? Well, because most churches teach only the heavenly hope. Isn't that true? But this fact highlights the need for true Christians to find out what does the Bible really teach on matters like this. Let's take a moment to see what the Bible teaches on that. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 14, and let's take a look at the latter part of verse 4. Now here, we're talking about those who have this heavenly hope, and notice how they're described. In the latter part of verse 4 there, Revelation 14, says, These were bought from among mankind as firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. Now it's interesting that the term first fruits there is used, because if the only hope available was heavenly life, there would be no need to differentiate between those that would come first and any that would be afterward. There would only be one hope. But here the indication is that since we call them first fruits, that there must be something that follows that would have God's approval. I'm not quite sure I understood the point that was just being made. Because he said that these are the first fruits of those who are going to heaven. And because of that, we're supposed to conclude that there's going to be another class of Christians with a separate eternal hope. I'm not sure you can really derive that from the text. All we can say from that is these are the first ones, and that there will be some after. And I'm not sure if we can really get from that specific word, or even that text, that these Christians are going to heaven, and there's another class of Christians going to earth. I'm just not sure I follow that kind of reasoning. Further evidence of that is found if you turn to John chapter 10, and verse 16. John chapter 10 and verse 16. Now you recall that Jesus referred to those with the heavenly hope as a little flock. Now notice his further words here in John 10, 16. It says, And I have other sheep which are not of this fold, those also I must bring, and they will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock, one shepherd. So here we see a separate group, other sheep. There's a little flock and the other sheep, both which have God's approval. 